everyone. This week I had a bit of fun playing around on LinkedIn. Thank you for all of you that jumped in with some comments. Um, I had a late night earlier in the week and came across a post that kind of threw me off and it just really stirred up my little inner activist. And so I threw this, this comment out there um, and a few of you engaged, which was great. And the, the conversation was all around trying to better ourselves and our approach to um, stressful circumstances in our business. Specifically, why do we have to have this conversation about compassionate ways to go through a, conduct a redundancy process when in actual fact, how about we solve the need for that whole process in the first place? Um, so there's a bit of engagement that was good fun. Thank you. I really appreciate all of you that commented and um, brought forward your opinions that, that your experience is valid and I really appreciate engaging in the conversation because this is big important stuff and we've all got di differing perspectives and opinions on it and we've got to work this out between us and so um, so value that and in some of those comments uh, someone called me out on uh, this ability to move people to work. So they described a situation in which they would find it challenging to shift people around. So one of the core concepts that we were talking about was this idea that if we understand what matters to customers, then let's move people to that work rather than uh, doing a whole bunch of other things. So this person had called out the situation where they said for um, for their situation, they were potentially not able to move people to work. They had a number of factors that might influence their ability to move people to work. And so what I thought I would do this week is hold myself to account and share a little bit more around my philosophy and my practices in how we move people to the work. So caveat here, my practice is based largely in uh, corporate enterprise, so big teams, big scales not specifically in smaller businesses. And so if you are in that situation, rather than a giant corporate, then you may have to think a little harder about how you apply these principles to your own situation. Having said that, you can absolutely do it. I use these same principles in my own micro business all the time. So this stuff works at all scales. And it's totally valid. It's that just that sometimes you have to do a little bit more thinking through and adapt the principles to your specific situation. But I will do my best to try and be as wide reaching as I possibly can in the five to 10 minute video that, uh, that we're currently recording. So <laughs> move people to work. The ability to move your people around uh, the different types of work that are coming into your organization. This idea of, I guess, mobility of your workforce is centered on a bit of an assumption, and that is that you know what the work is, you understand what the important work is, and you, you are able to reposition people across different types of work. So it's predicated on this understanding of different types of work in your organization. So step one around understanding what are those different types of work you will have heard me wax lyrical about the Vanguard method, which is one of my favorite tools for understanding work types from the perspective of our customer. Understand what your customers want, go and work out how to do that, line up everything you do behind that. And so you will hear me talk about systems thinking practices as one method to understand the type of work that you might choose to orient your team around. Now, having said that, not everybody is capable or um, able to get access to those types of methods. And so one of the other methods that I have used is to look at the nature of the skill set that's required in specific work. And I'll give you an example. So working in an IT department where uh, they had a broad portfolio of uh, software development, hardware installs, infrastructure, um, like quite a breadth of different um, skills. The way that that organization chose to break down their work clusters, at least in the first instance, was to look at the type of skill set that was required and to try and develop up this cluster of work that wasn't all around one specific skill type, but it was all about a type of uh, delivery or we could say a modality. And as an example, they had a team that was focused largely on digital and web type development. 
they had another team that was focused largely on the software and the running of call centers and the operations of call centers. And they had yet another team that was focused on how do we start to bring our infrastructure up to scratch so that we can support all of these other teams that are going on. And so for that organization, being able to break work down into those clusters, that was one stepping stone towards what later became more customer oriented work types. And so the way that you go about understanding your work type is to go back and study demand, whether that's customer demand or the inquiries that are coming from your stakeholders. There is this process by which you need to sit and look at what's coming in the front door. What are all the different sources of work? Where do they come from? What's landing in my team? Who's it coming from and why? And then from within what's coming at you, how do we start to cluster that? Not, not around um, the individual pieces, but like how do we make it manageable? That's what I mean when I say cluster. So there's this process of the first step in understanding how to move people to the work is to understand what the work is. And I've talked about that in a number of other videos. So like go th back through the blog and have a look for um, systems thinking methodology, understanding what your customers are asking for, um, those types of things. So you need to understand what's coming in the door. That's step one. And then the second element that I think is really core cool that I'll talk about today is what I call T-shaped skills. And again, I've talked about this in specifically in more detail in another post, but this idea of T-shaped skills is how do we start to develop our people in a way that means that we can acknowledge their deep expertise? Because everybody has their unique value proposition that they bring to, um, to the organization. So we want to honor, we want to really work with that deep expertise. And... What makes us truly great is the ability to have breadth as well. So I go back to that classic example of a team where you have a project manager, a BA, a tester, and a developer. Those four people have their specialist skill set. Absolutely, we're not trying to turn the project manager into the core dev. It's not what I'm talking about. But what we do want to do is make sure that that core uh, skill set, that person still has an understanding of all the other skill sets that are required to get the job done. That's what makes them really great. Great business analysts have an appreciation and an understanding of the testing that's required in software. Great developers have an appreciation and an understanding of how do we go about understanding what our stakeholders and what our customers need. So T-shaped skills is this concept around honoring deep expertise and building breadth, building resilience through our team structures so that people can move and start to jostle and position themselves as needed as that mix of work coming into the team might change. So those are two kind of fundamental pieces that help you put together this idea of moving people to the work. And then we also have those situations around crises. So the, um, one of the examples I talked to in a couple of the comments was an example of a local operator down here in New Zealand that when uh, the COVID, when the COVID hit, <laughs> when COVID hit and New Zealand closed the borders, what happened was that this operator, um, as it's the tourism industry in New Zealand generally, found that they had 80 to 90% worth of uh, revenue elimination overnight, like just boom, gone not coming back in the next three to five years until the borders open. So, so that was the reality of the situation that we faced. And that those situations, so crisis situations, rather different to our general day-to-day -day operating procedure, right? So what what happened with this particular um, with this particular company is that instead of pulling the lever to say, so we've got to cut costs, people are out. What they chose to do was they chose to step into a whole bunch of discomfort, gather the team together and said, how do we make this work? And so part of where I'm getting to with this idea of moving people to work is that we need to keep practicing and to keep evolving these ideas that get us closer to more compassionate conversations. Yes, and more compassionate ways of operating our organization day to day and better outcome for our employees and better outcomes for our customers at the same time. We, we absolutely have to make decisions in a crisis moment. And I'm no way trying to, uh, to call out individuals or the individual choices that have been made. 
or calling out as this greater systemic belief that that's just the method by which we do things. It doesn't have to be that way. But you've got to practice. So when crisis hits and you haven't been practicing these concepts, of course you're going to feel like you're in a situation where the only outcome is straight down that path. But if we practice these concepts about understanding the work that's coming to us, knowing what's coming down our funnel, being able to start to cluster our work and understand our demand types and our work types, we're practicing that skill and we're practicing that skill of actively growing our team with T-shaped skills, that ability to move and to, to not only have deep specialization, which is part of what makes us unique and hugely competitive, but also that breadth of understanding that makes us truly great we're practicing these concepts in our day-to-day, -day, then what happens is it's like building a muscle. We're building that muscle in the good times so that when the crisis hits, we can fall back onto those practices that we already have around, okay, what's coming at me? How do I structure our team best to respond to that? How do we do this collectively? And not being the only one making the decisions, actually having a conversation with the entire team about it. So... That's all I was going to share today. I hope that that has clarified in some more detail a couple of the solutions that I've used to help try and move people to work because it's a core, it's a really core concept in terms of building resilience and responsiveness in your organization. Uh, and I was conscious that in speaking to um, some of what came up this week, I had potentially missed a bit of a step. And so I wanted to lay out for you a couple of ideas, start to get you thinking in this direction, start building that muscle so that when the big stuff hits, we have options. We have alternative opportunities that we can pursue and we don't feel like we're just on this path and our only option to head down is that path of cut costs and that means head count and therefore we're in a situation of how do we make the crappy situation slightly better by having compassionate conversations rather than just blowing it all away. So that was what I wanted to share this week. Uh, I hope wherever you are in the world, you're having an awesome, awesome day. Hit me up with comments and questions below. Let's keep the conversation going. And I will see you all next week.